Um, this is being videoed, and I'll put it up, I guess, on my website, I assume on Pilk's website. Um, so again, I'd like you to put up hands for questions, and we're going to, um, your job is to prioritize women and young people. Um, that's your marching orders. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I did write the question, and I may need you to read it. I'm not sure I can do this. But Would you like me to read it for you? Is this... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, later today at 3, there is a panel focusing on the role of labor and a just transition to a caring economy. How can those who work from a heart-based space have a greater role and perceive value in our organizations and economy? Okay. Great question. Uh, anybody like to take that? Um, yeah. Um, thank you. I, I think about, I mean, so there's many different kinds of labor, but we can think about certainly labor as care work, um, and that care work that is done that's often invisible that sustains uh, all of our lives. Um, it is done disproportionately by women, by women of color. Um, and uh, but men, male labor is also often invisible. And as the economy um, is collapsing, as the climate crisis worsens, um, that that labor will intensify. It's intensified in my own life, um, and um, and so we can remember and understand that that's what's happening with each other, um, and create support systems to the extent that we can. I think creating community in the face of that is ever more essential. Um, and um, certainly structural answers like the Green New Deal are absolutely essential. So we need to think about it structurally as well and understand uh, that as um, part of the myth of the capitalist system has been our disconnection from one another, all of that care work is invisible within that and racism and sexism perpetuate that system. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited by the Green New Deal. I was um, actually very surprised at some of the reactions to it because in the communities that were discussing climate, you know, some of the principles and what is pr promoting is what we all think needs to happen. But instead, it, it's this really terrible kind of reaction, like how are we going to pay for it? And, and the principles, why does it include all these principles, have been really surprising to me. I guess it shouldn't be surprising. Um, I think, though, it's essential that you look at, you know, what you need to change in the economy to change the climate change, because it's not one action that will save us. It's actions across transport and housing and, and energy and all, and, and, you know, how we live and who has rights. All of that has to be a part of it. So I think there is a tremendous need for more people to speak out about what is so important and why this is not shouldn't be surprising and why these elements are essential just explain it in ways that people can understand because even though it's written in very clear language you find when you go to different communities that language is actually puts people off and so i think there needs to be a process of really figuring out how to let communities of, and different people from different backgrounds and ages really understand what it's saying and really make it even simpler than what it says now so people can really understand why it fits all together um, to improve um, uh, the way people see what jobs need to come out of a, a change in approach of, of, of how we view climate change. Everyone should go to the panel. <laughs> yes, Kari says everyone, uh, invites everyone to go to that panel today. Um, how are we doing on more questions? Yes. This is for Katya, but anybody else who wants to also join in. Um, Katya, I still remember bringing our youngest daughter to visit you when she was four weeks old, you and Tim at a tree sit. <laughs> and our kids have known each other since your kids and they were in grade school together. Um, so we have children who have been raised in a bubble, in a way that, that has been connected with the earth and with the power of what's going on in environmental activism since they were babies. But they're now out there in the world with other people who have not raised their children that way. Our daughter is now in college in North Carolina and she struggles daily with this with her own boyfriend. 
how do we support our young people in reaching out with all of the social anxiety that comes with just becoming adults and also reaching out across those bridges or building those bridges to children and young people who have not been raised that way at all? Okay. Um, well, I don't, you know, I don't know if I have a, the answer, obviously, but, um, yeah, we, there is a bubble, I get that, and um, one thing that, you know, I've tried to do to some degree um, is, is try to have my kids be culturally competent um, to the larger culture, um, and this may be shocking, but that may include things like watching mainstream TV and uh, social media and, um, you know, just sort of like what, who is, who's out there? What is the actual temperature of the rest of the society? Um, and I've, I have really um, defied some of the thinking of, you know, keep your kid in this bubble, protect it from the bigger world. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, I think my daughter might have answers that I can't think of, of ways um, and how that's impacted her. Um, but I think it is important that the kids really understand the context of the work that we're doing, um, the larger context. So, um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, I'll just add that I think when young people, so if you're not parented in a particular way and you don't learn it from your home life or your church life or your school life, um, then you're at a disadvantage, you know, not understanding the connections between the climate system or nature and how that affects you in your own life and why you should care about it. But there's so many opportunities now in this globalized communication world for young people to, to learn. And so I find with our work, you know, we work with a really diverse population of young people from all over. And a lot of these youth are inspired by their teachers or other youth who bring these stories to them. So I really think it's, it's reaching out to young people, not giving up on young people who don't grow up in the Eugene bubble and, and hear this, but knowing that they can be reached and they can have their eyes wide open, and we see that even with our, within our plaintiff group, that young people just being exposed to it and suddenly going, wow, and then turning that into activism. So I think it's really crucial to just reach as many young people as we can um, because they're open to hearing these stories and connecting. <coughs> um, okay, we have... Right here? Uh, or who has the microphone? Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you everybody for being here today and thanks to all the organizers for putting this together. I have a question. There was a reference to the future as an abstract concept and I feel like the idea of utilizing love and environmental engagement work and in coalition building is also an abstract concept. And I'm sad to say that I've seen folks use language like working from a heart space to retreat into that privileged place of ambivalence or denial, and I've seen it be really passive. So I'm curious if you have more concrete examples or responses about working from a place of love but still being vigilant and active and engaged um, from that love space at the same time. Thanks. I just want to say one thing about that. I mean, I think. I totally hear that, like this, this idea that we can go and go to our mindfulness workshops and just like do self-care and then to deal with our own trauma, but then not continue to struggle is really a problem in this sociological dynamic among adults. I, I'm not going to put that on kids because I think kids are profoundly impacted in a mental health way by what adults have done to the planet. but. I, I think, look at Dr. King, you know, like, it is a struggle and we have to keep struggling and we need to do self-care, but if we remove ourselves from the struggle, then we are giving up on that soul connection and the work that we need to be doing. So I think it's okay to struggle and feel like we need to keep struggling, recharge, and then go back and keep engaging in the struggle. So 
So, I'm sorry, I can't remember what year it was. I was at a bunch of different rallies that were like practice runs for practice runs for the People's Climate March in 2014. So this was probably like spring 2012, and I was at a small action in DC that was not very well organized and lots of critiques, but my biggest critique of that action is that the organizers had brought like a big globe and I was one of some young people who were like holding the globe and dancing around the globe and singing we've got the whole world in our hands and the organizers told us to stop singing and dancing because this was a solemn action designed to showcase the seriousness of the threat we were facing. And yeah, oi, what a missed opportunity, right? And, and so I want to share with you what I know I've shared with some of you, which is one of my greatest teachers, Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum, says all the time in this time that joy is an act of spiritual and political resistance. And sometimes, you know, we just need to draw from whatever it is that we've got to energize us. And there is too much emphasis on drawing from our fear or drawing from our outrage, which are really valid emotions. And if we have plenty of fear and outrage to draw from, like, yes, take those and run with them. But um, those of us who want to sing and dance, um, there, there has to be room in the movement for our joy to also be really present. So that, that would be my mom. I see the clock is telling us we have to go, so I'm sorry, I, we can't do we anymore. We just want to know what happened but, to the Mongolian herder story. <laughs> okay, so maybe you can ask her afterwards, oh, because we have two more people that would like to uh, chime in on this question, and, and then we're going to say goodbye. I'm sorry about the, the timing, but that's how it is. Yes, uh, really briefly, um, you have to love the earth. You have to draw your strength and be grounded from, from the planet. You have to see the value in it, you have to find the joy. And I think that that is how you take that abstraction and make it real for your life. Yep. So that's what I recommend. Yep. And I would say um, about relationships and who we're accountable to. And um, are there people whose lives look very different than yours who you are accountable to over long periods of time who you would, would are in struggle with and have a commitment to? And I think for too many people who are privileged, who are white, that is not the case. And I would say that that is one very, I really appreciate the question. It is, um, was my problem with thinking about love um, as well, it, it be, and parenthood as well. Um, incredibly important formative forces in my life, and we have to think about them um, in the context of privilege and um, social, uh, really social justice, and thinking about racism and colonialism and all these things. Carol, do you want to quickly tell us what happened with the Mongolian herder? <laughs> There's somebody here who's representing. Okay. Um, well, we've been working with, uh, with different parts of the community. Um, they they took um, their one of their cases to Parliament to try and get them to stop mining in at least the river. River. They were mining the river and on the land or around the community. Um, and. Um, the parliament did say that they would ban mining in the river, but then parliament then moved the mines like above the community instead. So they're now looking at doing some legal action because there's just so many mines, they've moved them around, but they're still trying to, to use other mechanisms to, to let them um, go ahead. So yeah, it's an ongoing battle. It's one that almost feels like it's never over. It's it's about consistency and determination, but I think. they haven't given up. They haven't yeah. given up. They've even formed their own local NGO um, wow. to help give them, you know, more space to advocate for on this issue. So. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you to all of these wonderful panelists, and to Bill McKibben for his um, video, and please, I encourage you to pick up um, his remarks and to look on marydemocra.com. I'll have it posted by tomorrow morning, or well, let's say by tonight at 10. I'll have his video posted. It's a wonderful video. I'm really sorry we didn't have time, but it did seem like it was important to uh, allow these ideas to fully blossom uh, here. Okay, thanks again.